with Adamen today is the 30th day of Hatur. However, we are going to read from the first Sunday of Kiak. So we technically have started the month of Kiak. And with that, we have the beautiful Kiak praises that we began last night. And we will have some of the uh, all night liturgies that are tied to them. The first one was last night. Today we focus on the Annunciation of St. John's birth. And you'll see in this month of Kiak that all the readings, the four Sundays, are taken from Luke chapter 1. And it's divided in such a way that we see the symmetry that happens. The Annunciation of St. John, eventually we're going to see the Annunciation of our Lord. We see the Nativity of St. John, the birth of St. John, and then we see the Nativity of our Lord the birth of Christ. And in the middle of those readings, we see this visit that connects the two, St. Mary and St. Elizabeth, when St. Mary goes to visit St. Elizabeth. And this beautiful symmetry that late St. Luke puts in front of us, the church celebrates this in this month. And so <clears throat> today we reflect on the Annunciation of one of the most unusual and important people in the history of our faith which is St. John the Baptist. There's nothing about St. John that's predictable, that's, that's normal, right? Not his ministry, not his conception, not his parents, not what was going on around him. There was nothing that was predictable. And that, I think that's exactly what we're supposed to reflect on. Because God's ways are not our ways. His salvation and his blessings are not extensions of our own habits, they're not extensions of our own plans and our own preferences. He calls us to a kingdom not of this world, in which a barren old married woman gives birth to one of the greatest prophets that ever lived. And a righteous virgin carries the Son of God in her womb. He overthrows political and religious leaders with little babies and pregnant women and confused old men. He prepares the way for the Messiah with a prophet who lived anything but a conventional and comfortable life. St. John, he has the titles of prophet and forerunner and Baptist, speaking the word of the Lord as he prepared the way for the coming of Christ, calling God's people to repentance and to baptism, and even baptizing the incarnate Son of God. Even before St. John was born, he, was, he pointed to Christ, leaping in the womb of St. Elizabeth at the arrival of the pregnant Theotokos, who contained within her the Savior of the world. St. John's Annunciation was miraculous, and his parents were old, and they were this childless Jewish couple. But we've heard this story before. We've heard this story through Abraham and Sarah. This should sound familiar. When the Lord came to Abraham and to Sarah, the picture that we're given in Genesis chapter 18 is that we see three angels walking and meeting with them. And on this visitation, when Sarah hears the words, Sarah, your wife will have a son. She doesn't believe. She doesn't respond with faith. There's no joy. She doesn't respond with belief, but she responds with this laughter within herself. There's no way. There's no way this is going to happen. I'm 90 years old. He's 100. There's no way. It just can't be. We've heard this story before. And then we see Archangel Gabriel appearing to this holy priest, Zacharias. He's a saint. He's a priest of God. And in the scripture, in what we read today, in Luke chapter 1, verse 6, it says that he and St. Elizabeth were both righteous. They were righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances, blameless. And then when the Archangel Gabriel appears to him and tells him that his wife will conceive, he doesn't believe it. In verse 18, how shall I know this? I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years. 
This is what he said. This is what was his response. Zacharias used the same phrases, the same language that Abraham and Sarah used. They questioned how could he how could he know that God would make him the father of a multitude? Zacharias must have known the story of Abraham. This is not foreign to him. He should have welcomed this wonderful news with faith and joy. But he doubted. He doubted. And he was disciplined. He lost the ability to speak until St. John was born. What's the point? What's the point of all this? Why am I emphasizing these points? The point is that if God can reverse death itself, then why do we put limits on what is possible during our own difficulties? Are we not part of this adopted family of God through our baptisms? When we say things like, we will never get better, or when we say that people will never change, we're saying a couple things here. One of two things. Number one, either we don't we believe that God is powerless, or we believe that God is not part of the solution. For Christians, nothing is impossible because God is already part of our lives. Not simply with words, because sometimes words are, are empty. God is part of our lives. He is tangible through the life of the church. Issues that may seem, on a human level, completely impossible to deal with or to imagine, are regularly brought before the Lord and His feet here in the church. We run to the altar. We know that Christ is the physician of our souls. And it might be impossible for me to feel like I can ever be anything but this sinner, this miserable sinner. It may be impossible for me to think that I can overcome my awful habits or even my addictive behaviors. When someone has struggled with these spiritual illnesses for a long time, they carry this, this weight on themselves. And there is no doubt that life is quite difficult at times. Absolutely. Sometimes it feels impossible. And sometimes, in the midst of our hardest and most challenging points in our lives, we have ideas and thoughts about what would make everything better. We say to ourselves, if only I had more money, things would be better. If only I had better health, things would be better. If only I had better friends, things would be better. If only I was in a relationship, things would be better. We come up with this multitude of man-made solutions to our most difficult problems in our life, but the words of the gospel bring our attention to the most holistic solution. Most of most times, this solution is right in front of our faces, but we don't have the spiritual eyes to see what we need to see. And I think more importantly, and I'm speaking as a public confession, we don't have the faith to see it. The solution to all the impossible difficulties of life is not to find a better human answer. No, we'll be frustrated. We'll continue to be frustrated. But we need to turn our eyes to the one who does what is beyond comprehension to our Lord, to our Master, and He will offer you something greater than you can imagine. This makes me think <clears throat> of the story of the Roman centurion. This is He was a non-Jew. This man who may not have known the first thing about Jewish religion. He was not raised in the faith, 
and he seemed to show a greater understanding of what faith is. How is it possible? Despite the fact that he probably had not read any Jewish scripture or gone to synagogue or heard the teachings of the prophets, he understood something that was amazing. He understood the power of Jesus Christ. And as a reminder, some context of the story, his servant was sick. The Roman centurion serv his servant was sick. And so he went to Jesus and asked him for help. This was already a sign for faith. The fact that he even went to Christ in the first place. And listen to the way the centurion responds. He says, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. This is completely stunning. He wasn't even a Jew. He showed so much humility. He understood his unworthiness to receive Christ even in his home. And he showed that he truly believed that Jesus could heal the servant even without ever seeing him. Without ever laying a hand on him. This man was faithful. We know, speaking for myself, we claim to know the true identity of Christ. We sing to him, we pray to him, we worship him, we engage in the scriptures, I hope. We receive the sacraments. But do we have the faith of this Roman man? This is not a rhetorical question, right? We really have to know whether or not we have this faith. Do we really believe that we are unworthy of the grace of God? Do we really believe that the Lord has the power to cure and to heal just by saying a word? It's not that Jesus wants to punish us because of our lack of faith. Be careful. Be careful. Listen to the words of the centurion. Our Lord's words to the centurion. He says, go your way. As you have believed, so let it be done for you. As you have believed, let it be done for you. This is a simple explanation of the life in Christ. In other words, there are places where Christ could not heal because the people lacked in faith. We see this recorded in the scriptures, but did he punish them? No, not at all. He allowed them to receive whatever they were faithful enough to receive. I hope that makes sense. There was no punishment. He was able to allow them to receive whatever they were faithful to receive. And he does the same with each one of us. He doesn't punish us. And that's why when someone says, prayer is hard, confessing is difficult, fasting is impossible, then I, I want to remind the people that none of these things are actually tough. When you say that prayer is hard, what we're really saying is that we don't believe that prayer is worth the effort. That's what we're really saying. When we're saying that God is nowhere to be found in prayer, so, it's just a waste of time. Why pray? In other words, the Lord might as well very well to say to someone like me, go your way, and as you believed, let it be done for you. But what have we actually believed? Not much. So then what do we expect to happen? Not much. The danger is, you may know God as a theory, but then there's nothing to back that theory up when we begin conducting our experiments. Tasting and seeing that God really and truly is good. 
And this is a double-edged sword, though, because the good news is that God will support and he will aid us according to our faith. There is no bounds to the amount of grace and healing and help that God offers us according to his will. He's not stingy. He will allow this grace to shower us and he will say to us, go your way as you have believed, so let it be done for you. I pray that we hear these words as a uplifting positive sign for our growing love for God. Let's come back to today. The same God who worked in such outrageous ways through St. John and St. John's parents and people like the Roman centurion and his servants, he continues to operate in our lives, in our church, and he operates in our world. And he calls each one of us to do what Zacharias originally failed to do, to believe, obey. Salvation and blessings are really for us, his children. And we have a unique role to play in how the Lord redeems and heals his good creation here and now today in this generation. Oftentimes we sell ourselves and God short. We rest easy with our faith. And I think we rarely take God at his word. Yes, our Savior wants to make us perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect. He wants to make us shine. He wants us to forgive those who have wronged us. He wants us to love our enemies. He wants us to care for him in the needy, those who are outcast. He wants us to refuse to worship the false gods of power and wealth and pleasure. He wants us to treat everyone who bears his image and his likeness with the same love that we should show him. St. John the Baptist is a reminder that we won't be transformed by business as usual. We need change. We need this radical change. We need this. We need a dependence and openness to the power of God. A God who does not operate according to our preferences, our agenda. And instead of coming up with the usual excuses as to why we can't believe or to live as Christ taught, it's time to be shaken out of our complacency. It's time to recognize that what has brought us weakness and despair and sorrow will simply continue to do the same. We will get more of it. A little bit of convenient religion in our lives. It may produce socially respectable people, sure, but not those who manifest the heavenly kingdom in this life. The Jews of the first century desperately needed a wake-up call. And did they ever get one with St. John? The prophet, the forerunner, the Baptist. And we still need his shocking message and his witness. Even as Zacharias eventually, he came to his senses. We can too. The Lord wants to replace our spiritual barrenness with an abundance of new life as a sign of the salvation of the world. Let us take him at his word. Let us take him at his word and have faith to live accordingly. And glory be to God forever. Amen.